Okay. It is uh, by my the clock on my computer. It is 7 p.m. Utah time, Mountain Daylight time, and we are ready to start. According to my computer, you can hear my voice and you can see my screen. And I will introduce the program and then we'll turn the time over to Dr. Perigo, who is also online with us uh, tonight. Welcome to the UGA virtual chapter. We meet every third Thursday evening, uh, except uh, for the month of uh, December. Anyone can register for free to attend the uh, live broadcast. And if you uh, want to register for future uh, UGA virtual chapter meetings, go to the UGA website and uh, go to the virtual chapter uh, link there and you'll find a place where you can click to register and it will ask for your email address and it will mail you an email uh, which you can then it will email you uh, a link uh, which on the night of the broadcast you click to uh, enter the broadcast. Um, as I've mentioned before, for those of you uh, just joining us, there is a handout that Dr. Perigo has provided for us. It's in the handouts on the control panel on your uh, go to meeting uh, uh, screen, as well as in my Dropbox for those who can't get it from the go to meeting. There's a link to that in the chat box. Uh, click on that link and it should take you to my the public uh, folder in my Dropbox where you can download the uh, uh, the program, the uh, handout itself. It's a PDF and it's uh, three pages long. Um, okay, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. There are people attending. Usually we have people from all over the U.S., a few from Canada and occasionally some from uh, Europe. And uh, right now I don't know where you're all from, but uh, there are uh, people from around the U.S. for sure and probably uh, uh, other countries. We are grateful to have you here. Um, we have these on the third Thursday evening of every month except December. And today is Thursday, August 17th, 2017. I'm Don Snow. I'm your virtual chapter host. And I'm on the board of directors of the UGA. I'm in Provo, Utah. And also online with us this evening is our presenter, Dr. Uh, Ugo Perigo from Rome, Italy but he's presently visiting in Provo, Utah. I'll introduce him and his topic in a minute. Uh, please have a look at the UGA website. I'm going to click on my uh, computer so that you'll be able to see what the UGA website uh, looks like. This is our website and there's information on there about the uh, virtual chapter presentations, about tonight's meeting. I'm going to click up here on the home uh, button over on the left side where it says welcome to UGA check on the things about our what we're doing and our uh, activities and you'll notice that we're heavily involved with family history education uh, you'll see the information there on our uh, uh, SLIG S-L-I-G that stands for Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy that's a very popular program uh, we run that every year in January in Salt Lake City near the Family Search Library and uh, it's always well attended with several hundred people and as soon as they open the registration for that many of the tracks fill up within a few minutes there are still some that are available for this next uh, conference in January of 2018 uh, so you might if you're interested in that you might log on and, and uh, uh, note what's available there we're also making some changes in that program that will be coming up later on where there'll be a two week long period of uh, information on, on family history. Um, our spring meeting was held in April of this year at Woods Cross High School. That's just north of Salt Lake City. And we're planning a fall meeting. That'll be in September in Pocatello, Idaho. We'll be meeting there with the Southern Idaho Genealogy Group. We also have online uh, programs, a special interest group that meets on the internet uh, about DNA. And of course that ties in with uh, Dr. Perigo's uh, program tonight. 
The live presentations are open to everybody, whether you're a member of the UGA or not. And uh, if you decide that you want to join, then you have access to all the past uh, programs, the uh, uh, earlier uh, virtual chapter meetings that we've had, and they've been going on for several years because we record them and they're posted on our website for those who are uh, members. Membership is not expensive and the videos are great to watch either individually or to use in uh, classes. And if you decide you want to join on our web page, there is a place where you can uh, uh, sign up and you also have other benefits for, uh, to it uh, by joining, etc. Okay, there's the invitation to join down near the bottom with the information on it. Okay, now I am going to click on the virtual chapter. Um, here is the information on the virtual chapter. There's the write-up about the information for tonight uh, with a picture of Dr. Perigo. Information about him, I'll introduce that in just a second. Further down here, uh, there's information on uh, other uh, uh, related information on a flyer. If you click on this down near the bottom there where it says a flyer, if I click on that, that brings up this flyer that you were seeing before. And that has all the information about uh, him and uh, his topic. Uh, Dr. Ugo Perigo is from uh, Rome, Italy. Uh, and he's visiting in Provo, Utah at the present time. So he's speaking to us from uh, here in Provo uh, this evening. He was born in Milan, Italy, and he received a Bachelor of Science degree and Master of Science degree in Health Sciences from Brigham Young University right here in Provo, Utah. Uh, his degrees included minors in Business Management and Ancient Scriptures. His PhD in Genetics and Biomolecular Sciences is from the University of Pavia in Italy. He worked as a senior researcher for the nonprofit Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation. Some of you will remember that organization. From 1999 to 2012, and he did part-time college-level teaching at BYU, Brigham Young University, and the Salt Lake Community College. He and his family now live in Rome, Italy, where he is the coordinator for the Seminary and Institute program for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, uh, for Central Italy and Malta. He is also the director of the Rome Institute Campus for Religion, and he's the chair for the BYU-Idaho Pathway Program for the Rome uh, side. He continues with his scientific work and is a visiting scientist at the University of Pavia and works with collaborators at universities here in Utah, in Illinois, in Rome, and in Florence. I first met Ugo many years ago when he and Dr. Scott Woodward came to one of our Utah Valley Technology and Genealogy Group meetings in Provo. And they talked about DNA back in the early days of DNA. And they took blood samples from all of us and five generation pedigree charts. Uh, that was for the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation DNA project. They no longer have to use blood samples. Now you just get a cheek swab and that's a lot easier. His topic tonight is famous DNA. A close look at Joseph Smith's genes. And he will tell us about this evening, uh, about this example with DNA information for a famous person by studying DNA samples from descendants and relatives. Most of you will recognize Joseph Smith as the founder of the Mormon faith. There is a good handout, as I've mentioned, available on the uh, website, on the handouts, as well as uh, in the chat uh, box. There's a link to where you can download it from my Dropbox if you can't get it from the, the uh, handouts window. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box that's there on your uh, on your control panel on your computer, and I'll uh, uh, monitor those. And most of those we'll save till the end after he finishes uh, uh, to answer those. If you if there's something that we re we really need to break in, I'll I'll break in and and uh, uh, comment on it. Okay, I think that we're ready to go. And so, Ugo, I am going to change pre presenters. I'm going to click on change presenter to Ugo Perigo. I want to change to him. Yes, I click on that. 
and it'll take a second as it catches up with us. And there is Ugo's uh, program, and Ugo, you are on. All right, well, thank you, Don, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I like to apologize for my accent. Uh, you know what? I've not been blessed with the gift of of, uh, of language. I've been blessed though, with uh, a very good Italian look, and uh, you're not gonna see me tonight, so you're gonna have to take my word for it. Um, but hopefully, you can you can follow along, and um, the images that we are going to see um, are gonna share with you will also help you make sense of it. Um, so. Why Joseph Smith and why this topic and why um, is that relevant? Um, as Don said, I uh, started working with Scott Woodward, a professor of molecular biology back then at Brigham Young University. <coughs> I was uh, uh, asked to be his assistant for a large project, an ambitious project whose goal was to uh, collect uh, hundred about hundred thousand DNA samples, blood samples or saliva samples, from uh, di uh, different people around the world, representing different f uh, family lines as well as different countries. And um, the re the requirements at that time, what we envisioned was to collect with the DNA uh, some very extensive and extended pedigree charts. The project uh, that we started in 1999. <coughs> was uh, um, based on the fact that we received DNA from common ancestors and uh, as we share common ancestors, as that is proven genealogically, also we share common DNA. And so the goal was to identify specific sites, uh, sections, segments of DNA that uh, we that are alive, living, living people, living descendants, carry from our ancestors and share with individuals that are closely related to us. Most of you know how this work nowadays. Uh, there are probably many of you that are listening that have experimented um, with, uh, with DNA testing. Some of you are probably pretty good at it and have a good gra um, grasp on, on how that works. Others might just have done a DNA test for out of curiosity or maybe because there was a special cell and, uh, and you just uh, uh, figure out how to uh, maybe that was a good time to, to, to you know get that done and see what they look like. Now um, I want to point to a couple websites uh, before I continue that are on this slide. Um, first of all you know here is my contact information if you need to contact me but um, I, I, the Joseph Smith DNA website is a little bit my uh, online library or repository for uh, um, some publications that I have uh, either author or co-author with other researchers, um, both scientifically um, of, of uh, um, general interest with regard to DNA studies and population studies. Some that are more targeted to genealogical and genetic studies and others that are, have been done with regard to um, Latter-day Saints or Mormon history um, relevance uh, studies and that's because again most of this work that we started with Scott Woodward back in 1999 was done at Brigham Young University here in Utah and, uh, and therefore um, there are a lot of people that are uh, Mormons, members of the, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here in Utah and uh, they would approach me with questions that had to do with uh, uh, Mormon history and if DNA could help with that. So I, I work on a few of these projects including Joseph Smith which we're going to talk about today and uh, then post, publish, read and publish these, uh, these stories, these articles and eventually um, posted, you know, after they've been published, I posted them on this website called Joseph Smith DNA. So there is not only uh, articles there that are relevant to, to Joseph Smith, there are also articles that are relevant to my other research interests and, uh, and uh, publications. The other site, the Genetic Genealogy Consultant, is uh, um, uh, a website that uh, I run as a side business. Um, hopefully I can, I can say something about it right now without, um, I, I don't know, I'm not trying to make you know to do publicity about my, my jobs, but um, genetic genealogy consultant is what I do on the side with regard to uh, using my expertise with the DNA to help people that uh, um, have done DNA testing for family history. 
So anyone that uh, uh, goes from uh, um, considering DNA testing to answer specific questions from individuals that already have done their DNA tests, but they're not sure if they're getting the most out of it, um, I usually um, you know, help these individuals with uh, private consultation, written consultations, or, or uh, um, video conferencing where I guide them through and help them with uh, um, their questions and their needs for uh, DNA testing and family history. So those are the two websites that, that I have if anybody is interested. So going back uh, to, to, the, to the 1999 and when we started working on this project and since we were in Utah, um, we were truly pioneers at that time of using DNA for family history. The very first uh, genetic company that was starting about that time was Family Tree DNA, and they were very at the very beginning, 1999, 2000, was where they really um, uh, created this service available to the genealogist, uh, a commercial service where people could get their DNA test. The DNA was fairly expensive back then. The databases were basically inexistent, and um, the, the the amount of DNA information provided with tools and explanations and uh, uh, the jargon and so on was uh, was uh, not something that a lot of people at that time were uh, knew. Um, DNA was not back then a topic among genealogists, and uh, we started working on that as a as a research project. Family Tree DNA started as a commercial project in uh, back in uh, in. Uh, uh, Texas, and uh, the two, um, the two of us, you know, the, our project at BYU and uh, and Family Tree DNA, were really the pioneers back in those days. And one, what we did here in Utah was to approach large families, which you can find here in Utah, families that have good genealogies, which is a big part of the Mormon faith, and uh, ask them if they would be willing. To donate their DNA to our project, so we were looking at random individuals with extended genealogies, but also specific families um, where they could be helped. And one of these families, of course, was uh, the Smith family. Um, that counts, you know, several thousands descendants, um, either through Joseph Smith, who was the founder of the Mormon faith, or his uh, siblings. And uh, and that, you know, make a, a really it was one of the really easy to access family. For this type of study, and uh, and again, uh, um, as I as we approach this family, then individuals from this family start presenting cases to uh, to us. To me, was who I was responsible to collect these DNA samples, and I started receiving some phone calls around the year 2000, 2001, 2002, where uh, specific questions about the family history of Joseph Smith. Um, were not completely resolved through traditional genealogical approaches and asking if this new DNA thing was uh, going to help once and for all to clarify some of these issues. And so what I have here tonight and what I'm presenting is a summary of more than 15 years, almost two decades now, of uh, involvement with uh, the Smith family, Joseph Smith uh, descendants, and extended family and some of his siblings uh, answering this question. And again, why Joseph Smith? You know, one once is because it was a large family which we started working here um, here in Utah, but also um, because it becomes, in my mind, a perfect example of uh, things that anybody could do for their ancestors, for their families, for their genealogy using DNA. So what I'm presenting here, uh, yes, is a, is a Famous, I mean, at least within certain circles, and you know, uh, Joseph Smith is the founder of the largest um, <coughs> American religious movement, uh, American born religious movement. And, uh, and so, a lot of people know who he is, not necessarily they need to share um, the, the, the faith or their, their, uh, his vision and in theology, but at least a lot of people know who he is. And secondly, uh, again, everything that can be done with Smith can be done with anything and, and with anyone in, any fa in every family history. So as we look at these examples, you know, uh, hopefully uh, some of you that are listening can grasp the principle behind the application with these families, a particular family, and say and think, you know, wow, you know, I could be using 
the same approach to solve some of my family history situation. That's really the goal here is uh, uh, using the DNA for our personal family history, not just uh, um, watching a, a documentary, if you will, about somebody else's family history. I feel like that doesn't relate to us. Um, so wh when I start working on this, um, <clears throat> on this family case, that was uh, um, about the year 2000, 2001, and uh, I began approaching the family, collecting some DNA samples, going to some of the family reunions, and uh, you know you can imagine the uh, surprise, at least of, among some of the uh, older family members, as uh, they are all related with each other. And here there is this Italian uh, talking with a funny accent, uh, coming there at the reunion, you know, kind of crashing the party and uh, and uh, requesting. Um, for some speed, you know, uh, before they had their big meal, so that I could uh, um, move forward with this project. And uh, in 2005, I was able to, and we're going to see that later on, um, was able to publish the first report, the first article on Joseph Smith DNA. However, I end up publishing it in uh, a very uh, small, fairly unknown to the to the worldwide population uh, journal that dealt with uh, uh, history, particularly Mormon history, thinking that no one really would care about uh, uh, the finding and the discovery and the reconstruction of a, a signature, a genetic signature a profile of Joseph Smith. Number one, because I didn't think anybody cared about Joseph Smith in the, in the worldwide um, community. Uh, in the general community, and second, because I didn't think that reconstructing his Y chromosome was that big of a deal. However, um, as I attended different conferences, uh, science conferences around the, the, the country, um, I happened to glance at, uh, at the program at the largest and most prestigious uh, gene genetic gathering, the American Society of Human Genetics uh, that uh, is in the United States and attract thousands of people from all over the world. It really is like the top-notch uh, genetic conference. And as I was looking at the program, my eyes uh, fall and, and I caught um, a title where there was a speaker, uh, again back in 2008-2009, that was going to talk about Joseph Smith DNA. And uh, that totally uh, caught me off guard because uh, um, I had no idea anybody else would even think about presenting something like that to such a prestigious conference. So I went there, attended the presentation, and uh, <coughs> at the end of the presentation I approached the presenter and uh, and told her that uh, the finding that she presented at his uh, gathering, at his convention, I already published them four years earlier, four years previously, in his uh, unknown or, or uh, not very well-known journal. and. Uh, she told me that she didn't know about it. She never, you know, I wouldn't be, I wasn't surprised. Um, but uh, as she was in the process to publish her findings in uh, in the uh, American Journal of Human Genetics, which is one of the most prestigious science journal uh, dealing with uh, human genetics, um, that uh, she already had a manuscript submitted, and all she was able to do was. Uh, Add a small uh, a note um, in the text, which you can see from these slides, in which she acknowledged um, the fact that she came to the conclusion and the reconstruction of Joseph Smith DNA independently from my research work, but that she acknowledged that their work, our work, was already done and published previously. And I felt stupid. I really felt <laughs> it's like I should, I, I just shoot too low, and I could have shoot higher and aim higher. And uh, and uh, maybe have a very nice publication back in 2005 in this journal as well, in which I did. And so that will be the one regret I'm going to live the rest of my life. But here is uh, here is uh, um, you know by fact the fact that what I did, at least at that time when we were at the beginning of uh, genetic genealogy, um, the same results independently were reached by somebody else, thus confirming uh, the process that I did. Um, in my in my research. So now going back 
to my work, we're going to go back to, to the beginning, not 2009 when this article was published. Um, we're going to look at what I did in these years with Joseph Smith. And I. So this is a classic uh, pedigree chart where you are, if there um, are a man or a woman or a male or a female at the end of the tree. And uh, there are basically for family history three methods that uh, are used widely to trace family histories. Um, on the left side you have the paternal line or the surname line in most Western uh, cultures and countries and um, that is the line that uh, is the father to son line, um, an unbroken father to son line or the surname line as I say, which uh, uh, follows um, the inheritance pattern for a section of DNA called the Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome is the little part of DNA which determines the male gender. So the presence of a Y chromosome, you have an offspring that is a boy, the absence of the Y chromosome results in an offspring or a female. Therefore, only males have the Y chromosome and the Y chromosome is used to trace paternal lines or reconstruct paternal information in a pedigree chart. Likewise, we have the mitochondrial DNA. We're going to talk about it uh, a little bit later. We're going to start with the Y chromosome and kind of delve. Um, that's where we're going to spend most of the time looking at stuff that I did with the Y chromosome of Joseph Smith. But we're also going to look at the mitochondrial DNA of Joseph Smith, which comes down from the female line or the mother to children line. Not mother to daughters only, but all the children receive their mother mitochondrial DNA, not a small segment of DNA but only females are able to pass it on to the next generation. So both males and females alive today carry a mitochondrial DNA. All of them receive it from their mother, who receive it from their mother, 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 all the way on the unbroken female or um, umbilical cord line, um, but the umbilical line. But uh, males will not pass it to their offspring. It will stop with them. And then the, the majority of our DNA, over 3 billion pieces of DNA, uh, is what is referred to autosomal DNA. This would be chromosomes 1 to 22. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chromosome 1 to 22 are the autosomes. And uh, uh, we pass 50% of that randomly um, at each generation. So I would have 50% of my father DNA. That's the percentage that you see in this tree. 50% uh, of my father DNA, I would also have 50% of my mother DNA. That's empirical, you know, I, I, I need to have that DNA to be who I am. But then in the next generation, the, the grandparents' generation, that becomes a probability. Um, so I, I, I have for sure 50% of my father and for sure 50% of my mother autosomal DNA. But I'm having an average of 25% of DNA from each of my grandparents which could be as little as 0%, although that's kind of unheard of, or as much as 50%, which is also quite unheard of, um, from each of my grandparents. So I could have, you know, more than 25% or less than 25% um, from each of them. But, you know, on average, when their generation are so close, we're looking about 25% and then go back 12, 6%. And as you can see, there are couple principles here. While um, one of the first principle is that while Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA have a known and specific uh, inheritance pattern, meaning we know exactly who we got that Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA from on a pedigree, which is our paternal or maternal line respectively. Um, with regard to autosomal DNA, although I have autosomal DNA and I can test it, uh, I cannot, if I'm the only person tested, I cannot know for sure if that part I'm looking at came from my mom or from my dad. Uh, to give you an example, if my autosomal DNA determines I have, you know, some Native American uh, ancestors, some Native American DNA, uh, I will not know if that came from mom or dad unless one of the two are also tested. And in that case, or maybe a cousin, you know, in that case, I can, by exclusion, understand um, where I got my DNA in the family. But that can be only done at the parents' level because then the same process has to happen at the grandparents' level. And if my grandparents passed away, um, then I will not know if I, 
I got the Native American, let's say I got it from my father, then I would not know if it was from my paternal father or my paternal grandmother, paternal grandfather, paternal grandmother, and so on and so forth. Also because I'm losing 50% of DNA, or autosomal DNA, every generation, um, what really happens is that within about five or six generations in the past, autosomal DNA becomes fairly useless uh, in linking to specific ancestors and reconstructing their origin with uh, um, being accurate. So autosomal DNA, it is the majority of our DNA, it is helpful for learning information about all of our ancestors and not the two outermost lines in our family tree, but is limited by the fact that we lose so much of it and so fast uh, um, with time. Y, auto, y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA uh, stay unchanged for thousands of years and can help us understand and recre recreate and reconstruct information about our ancestors, the paternal line, the maternal line, that would go back uh, even thousands of years. So we're going to focus now on the Y chromosome uh, of Joseph Smith, of the Smith family, and uh, um, two questions that have to do with his, uh, um, the ancestry, or in other words, the origin of the Smith line for this particular family, which was a question, and uh, also the posterity. So we're going to move backward and forward using the Y chromosome. And then later, we look at an application of autosomal DNA in this family, and, and lastly, at the very end, for the mitochondrial DNA. Now, um, there was a publication back in 1991 by the, uh, the large Smith family uh, genealogist. Her name was Elaine Nichols, and she published in the Utah Genealogical Journal, which I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And um, she basically wrote a, the, the, the current state of the genealogical research the, uh, the, the professional, uh, accurate research that has been done up to that point. And, uh, and the, what we have basically was that Joseph Smith Jr., the founder of Mormonism, was the son of Joseph Smith Sr., who, who you're seeing here circle with, uh, with uh, uh, a black line. And Joseph Smith Sr. Uh, had some siblings, and uh, uh, he was the son of Azor Smith, then Samuel, Samuel, and then Robert. And Robert Smith is supposedly born in 1626. We don't have um, a birth certificate for Robert Smith. What we have is a 1630, um, so, so we, we, we know a couple of things. One that is in 1638, at the age of 12, he shows up in New England without father, without mother, without siblings, and Robert Smith um, was an indentured servant They arrived with other youth, and they were servant of this landlord. They had property back in England in Lincolnshire, uh, that's the county, particularly this man was from Kirton, the town of Kirton in, in England. So people assumed that since this man that brought Robert with him was from Curtin and the county of Lincolnshire, that also Robert Smith should have uh, probably be there. And as Elaine Nichols did research in the area, she could not find or establish the provenance of his uh, uh, youth in the area, the parish records, any other information that we had about Robert Smith simply died. So when we look at our public databases, genealogical databases, people assume or infer or make some guesswork and say, well, probably, uh, the, you know, we find this other guy could be his father, and then they start tracing back from this, to, from this individual back in time. But the reality is, back, uh, we, we can only be sure about the genealogy back to Robert Smith, born approximately 1626, and that is it. So. <clears throat> we cannot make a jump over the pond. We cannot confidently trace the genealogy of this particular Smith line to any one or any places in England. So the question that I was asked from the family was, can DNA answer the question about the Smith origin in England? Can we find family relatives um, that are Smith in England that share the same genetic profile, the Y chromosome profile, profile of the Smith family, and establish a connection and perhaps 
been able to extend their genealogy and determine the place of origin uh, for this family. So that was the first question that uh, back in 2000 I started working on. So the first thing I needed to do was to identify uh, living male descendants of Joseph Smith in order to test their DNA and obtain a signature for the Y chromosome, a profile. So Joseph Smith Jr. in this case um, had two sons, Joseph Smith III and Alexander Hale Smith, and uh, that were the only two sons he had that grew up to adulthood and uh, had a living posterity today. He had other children, but all of them um, either died earlier uh, as youth, as infants or youth, or um, there is no living posterity for them. And again, um, there is a way to dig up uh, bodies from graves and test their DNA, but it's a lot more time-consuming, uh, very bureaucratic, uh, to some degree, could be also seen as disrespectful. You know, something that I prefer to avoid, if you know, if if, uh, if possible, um, in exhuming bodies and test of DNA is also very expensive, and there are no commercial laboratories that would do that. You kind of have to go through uh, academic laboratories. So the red tape and and the cost is, is fairly prohibitive to do that on a large scale with any ancestor. The best things to do with DNA is to try to go to the uh, descendants and uh, reconstruct the genetic information starting from the, the, the present and moving back to the past. So here we had an ideal situation where we found a list um, to start with, then we actually had more eventually, but to two males, S1 and S2, and these two males are both Smith and they are on a place on a genealogy of father to son on an unbroken line back to Joseph Smith Jr. who is the MRCA meaning is the most recent common ancestor of the of S1 and S2. Um, what, what does it mean is that once you take the DNA of S1 and S2 and you compare the section of the Y chromosome then uh, you'll know that if the two Y chromosomes are identical, the only person they could have got it from, the only ancestor they could have got it from, would have been Joseph Smith Jr. because that is the first ancestor in their tree where they connect. Okay, they don't make that connection uh, earlier on, and you wanted to do that. You want to go back to the one person that you are interested in knowing the Y chromosome. So from doing that, uh, these are uh, this is the, the, the reconstruction of the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is a, um, a long segment of DNA, about 60 million bases long, and along this, uh, this long stretch of DNA, scientists over the years have been able to identify some location or loci, locus singular, uh, in the first column, give it a name, and then uh, uh, look for a certain value uh, actually a count or, or repetition of a certain genetic pattern and then they count it up and they report that as a number but that's just don't, don't need to worry about it so much but we have this value and then uh, uh, when they uh, report these values then you can compare this set of values with other individuals and when you have matches and you see that the values are similar then you can start uh, um, pondering or wondering or researching if there is a possible paternal ancestor, common paternal ancestor between any two individuals uh, sharing the same Y chromosome. So in this case I had two uh, two living descendants of Alexander Hale, so that will be the line to the right uh, in this tree, and one descendant on Joseph Smith uh, third line which will be the line to the left. So as you can see column two, three, and four um, contains the actual empirical values from these three living people who share Joseph Smith as a descendant. The first two share Alexander Hale as a descendant and the three combined share Joseph Smith Jr. as a descendant. So as you make a comparison and you look at position one, the DYS which stands for DNA Y chromosome segment, that is kind of like a standard nomenclature for these sites, and then we look at site number 19, so DYS19, 
we see that the two descendants of Alexander Hale have a value of 15 and uh, Joseph Smith third descendant has also a value of 15 and since Joseph Smith is the most recent common ancestor of both lines then for sure a hundred percent sure then Joseph Smith would also have had a 15 in his DNA. This would be just as accurate as if we would collect a DNA sample from Joseph Smith himself. We would not expect to see anything different than a 15, a position 19. And as we repeat this process, uh, los, uh, locus after locus, throughout all this list of known loci, uh, known location, then we can do in the, in the fourth column, in the last column, the one that says Joseph Smith Jr. inferred or reconstructed Y chromosome apotype or signature then you get a series of values and that becomes a very unique and specific uh, Y chromosome profile not only for Joseph Smith but basically from, for anyone that is a Smith on the man line related to him. Now the only concern we had here was with uh, the locus called DYS 4, uh, 449 as you can see here in green and uh, the two Alexander Hell descendants had a 30 as a value and Joseph Smith third has a 31 so clearly along the two lines one of these two lines experienced a random mutation uh, and we don't know if Joseph Smith had a 30 originally or 31 we call that the ancestral value or whatever DNA that the ancestor had originally and who is that has the original value today and who has the mutated value. So to do and answer the question and have the most accurate genetic profile possible for the ancestors that we are interested in, in this case Joseph Smith Jr., then I extended the testing to relatives of Joseph Smith Jr. and as you can see from this tree, uh, I tested descendant from Samuel Smith who is a brother of Joseph and also another brother who is Hiram Smith and uh, I had individuals from each one of these lines, again following the rule of testing a direct male and broken line, father to son, Smith line for each one of them. So these are all living people at the bottom, all Smith, but not, not, right now they're not descendants of Joseph Smith Jr., they're descendants of Joseph Smith Sr., who is the father. He becomes now the most recent common ancestor. And as we compare data, we see a few mutations here. But our question, remember, was to determine DYS 449. And as we look at descendants of Hiram and Samuel Smith, who are siblings, son, uh, brothers of Joseph Smith, they also have a value of 30 there, which re means that uh, uh, Joseph Smith III, the one individual we tested, uh, belongs to a line that experienced a mutation in the time frame, in the generations between Joseph Smith and the person that was born. It's totally random, it's totally normal, it is expected to see some of these mutations um, kicking in and appearing over time um, in, in some of the lines. That means that every uh, descendant from this Joseph Smith third line will inherit the 31 for the generations to come and so on. But now for Joseph Smith, we know that we are looking at a value of 30. So as you can see, the last column has a very accurate, complete, um, unequivocal uh, Y chromosome profile for him. That is going to be now the standard, the, um, the, the, the set of values, the profile needed to find relatives hopefully in England, that is the question that we were going to ask, you know, this is going to be the type of genetic profile we're going to try to find. So some of the things you could do with that profile that I did was first to determine the geographic origin of these particular profiles and since um, we mutate, um, we have these random mutations over time and this mutation as people move around and expanded and conquered and settled in different parts of the world, uh, our ancient ancestors, um, then whenever there are these mutations like we see here in orange, that becomes markers also of specific geographic location because these markers would be more predominant in certain areas and not in others. And based on these values, based on this set of values, we can plug them in in online apps that are available. This is one of them. There are several. You, all you have to do is Google 
uh, Y chromosome um, predictor, uh, Y chromosome predictor, and you're gonna find at least a couple out there where you can plug in the list of values that you see for yourself or for an ancestor and uh, obtain a code that represents a geographic location in the world or is an indicator for maybe a special location. So right here um, you see that in, in the last uh, uh, part of the column in the, to the left um, you have all these uh, uh, names E3A, I1A, H, J1 and so on and so forth and then the last one on the bottom is R1B with a hundred percent probability which means that Joseph Smith profile a hundred percent probability that he belongs to this line called R1B. Now again, this is predicted, which means that uh, um, has not been verified yet. You know, that's but this is some earlier indicators. So next question is where is R1B found? Many of you probably know the uh, the answer to the question already. This is a simplified Y chromosome tree which shows the relationship of all the different Y chromosome uh, principal lines that are found around the world. So starting from the left, um, scientists have, uh, as they identify specific lines around the world for the Y chromosome, they have adopted a nomenclature of the letters of the alphabet, uh, then combine and alternating them with numbers and letters. And uh, so if you start from the left, you have letter A, which is the predominant uh, African uh, Y chromosome and it also has the longest branch in the tree because that is those are the oldest Y chromosome that we find on the earth today. And then as you move toward the right you see B, C, C is, a, is an Asian and Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal and North American uh, haplogroup and then you have a G which is from the Caucasus, uh, you have I, which is predominant in, in the Scandinavian Peninsula, uh, you have uh, uh, Q, which is found in, in uh, Native Americans in South America, R1A, which is predominant in uh, Eastern Europe, and finally R1B, which is the most common, about 40% of Western European lineages belong to their R1B. Consequently, the, the is also the, the most widely found in North America, as uh, is being colonized by um, by Europeans, Western Europeans. So that is where the Joseph Smith line comes from. Remember, we're trying to find where it is from in Europe, and Smith is a an indigenous or autochthonous surname for England. It is uh, one percent of the population in England and one percent of the population in North America is a Smith. It's the most common surname there. So you would think just the name Smith would say, you know, of course that is, that is England, right? But I want to make sure I was looking at the right place because again sometimes there are um, accidents that comes that happen along the paternal line. I call them the milkman syndrome, which basically you think you have the DNA of your father but it's actually somebody else. And uh, I think you're all grown up, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, so, you know, along this line, since we're going back several generations, I want to make sure that we were looking at uh, um, the right area. So it seems like we, it is. I won't be, I mean, at least we are in Europe. And here is uh, what's called a distribution map where R1B is found uh, most frequently in Europe. And uh, it is a typical uh, British um, uh, haplogroup, a, Brit a typical British. Uh, lineage. So again, we're looking about the right place. Again, as you can see, though, it's found pretty much all over Europe, but the highest concentration is in England. So <coughs> back in, in those days, there was a database available, which unfortunately um, is no longer available online. It was created by the Sonnenson Group, which allowed to plug in those values that we reconstructed or anyone's Y chromosome and look for um, common matches. So as you see here in this, uh, in this database in, in, on uh, the square with the light and dark blue boxes on the right of your screen, you see on the top line, I don't know if you can see my, uh, the little arrow from my mouse, um, these are the values on the top line that belongs to Joseph Smith, the one that we reconstructed. 
and as I enter these values in the database, I start looking for patterns. And again, I was looking and expecting to find a typical English from England um, connection. And here is the result. So I look at the first 150 closest matches in this database. There are many other databases online. This is what the one I used back in those days. It was the best that there was at that time. And um, out of the, the first 150 matches, the first 22 were all related to Joseph Smith Jr. grandfather, Azor Smith, which is, wasn't teaching anything new to me. With, you know, the only thing was, you know, I knew at least these people are all Smith and it was, you know, they were related with each other. But again, Azor Smith is found in the New World um, and that's not what I'm trying to, 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 to reconstruct. I want to find what's outside of the United States, where outside of the United States he came from. Then I had 35 matches with uh, individuals who shared um, the TPA is the terminal um, paternal ancestor. So these are individuals in the database that with their DNA they gave us their genealogies and have been able to trace their genealogies outside of the United States, in this case to Ireland. I also did some collections in, in the UK, including Ireland, and there could be also people that are born there. But as you can see in the, uh, in the table to your right, these are people that uh, are born and live um, for a few generations in the United States and then eventually go back to Ireland. If you look at the first case, you have Kentucky, 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 and then Maryland, and then Ireland going there, the Riley surname. So, so first 35 matches was, were Ireland, meaning this Joseph Smith profile uh, lined up uh, better or closely with uh, uh, Irish, these Irish individuals. Then I had 12 additional matches from Scotland, and then uh, uh, eventually uh, so only eight from England, and two from, from Denmark, and then other 72, which the, were the terminal paternal ancestor was born in the United States, so they were now able to provide a genealogy that would go past the United States, but this, the last name were mostly Irish and Scottish, which again, uh, there is this, uh, um, this northern UK pattern that was uh, surprising and, uh, and recurrent. So what I did was to do a, a different test. There is a second type of test you can do on your Y chromosome. And rather than reconstruct an extended profile as I did it, you can actually look for single milestones, um, little tiny changes that would create splits in the, in the Y chromosome tree in the past. These are called single nucleotide polymorphism or SNPs. Uh, family tree DNA is probably uh, one of the comp there are a couple of companies that actually are a principal uh, uh, tester for SNPs. One is Family Tree DNA. The other one uh, I can remember the name, but if you write to me, I can give you the name of that. They're both very good to test these uh, um, these single mutations, and uh, the the trees are extremely detailed with uh, uh, re uh, reconstructed. That. If you look at it um, on the very top left circle with a square with a red square. You have the R1B that we predicted for Joseph Smith, which is extremely general and superficial, and, and is found in a very large geographic area, so it doesn't really help us pinpoint anything. But look at how many sub-branches. There are hundreds, even thousands of known sub-branches for R1B, each one of them characterized by a specific genetic mutation. And you can buy this specific mutation and have them tested for your line. And then what you do with them is that there are more specific geographic distribution and you can pinpoint smaller geographic areas for your ancestors, which is what I did for Joseph Smith. I took uh, the DNA that I collected from the descendants. Now that they were established, they were true Smith descendants from this line. And I had them tested for some SNPs and uh, I've discovered that they were positive or they carried the marker called M222 which had the highest frequency in Northern Ireland. You see this uh, map of the UK, so the, uh, the brighter the red, the more people in the area carry the M222 markers, and the bluer the area, there are fewer or none 
individual carrying the M232 markers. So it's fine, particularly in, Ir in Ireland, especially in Northern Ireland, and a little bit in the lowland Scotland, which uh, uh, historically those two areas, Northern Ireland and Scotland, um, uh, witness um, sharing and migrations because of close proximity and also probably for a common hatred to, to the English uh, um, uh, kingdom and, and king. Um, and so there was more more mixing of genes maybe between those two, two, two countries. But um, <clears throat> now, now we know something here is that first we had uh, through the haplotype, through the profile, we will find a lot of matches that come from Ireland. Now with the SNP test also are confirmed a Irish origin. And about that time, there was a paper that came out in 2006 that uh, a group of scientists from uh, uh, Dublin, from the Trinity College, published his research paper, which uh, um, aim was to reconstruct the Y chromosome of a legendary warlord called uh, uh, Nile of the Nine Hostages. Uh, is a fifth century AD legendary uh, king figure similar to per perhaps uh, uh, King Arthur uh, with regard to um, the English royalty, you know, they, uh, one, one stratagem to uh, claim a right to the throne was to provide some sort of a mythological or uh, extraordinary genealogy which would show that you kind of have the right DNA to be the king. And so they, they um, maybe these people like King Arthur and Nile of the Nine Hostages really lived but through the generation, the stories surrounding this individual became so uh, surreal and, and fantastic that uh, uh, there was all meant to uh, establish the right and, and, and the glory of kingship uh, for the current monarchs. And so, um, with regards to this particular study, they, um, the kings of Northern England the claimed descendant to be descendants of this Nile of the Nine hostages uh, for five centuries uh, were rulers over northern Italy. So the northern Ireland, sorry, then there was Italy is a different thing. We we got some weirdos over there. That's that's not not kings like these ones, and um, we had uh, um, so there are five centuries, five un un uninterrupted centuries of dominion by these royal families, which had a large posterity. Whose surnames are what you see, for example, in this uh, in this list right here, and yet they all belong to this M222, and based on the reconstruction of descendants of this royal family, they were able to reconstruct on um, a specific Y chromosome haplotype, which is what you see right there on the table to the top part of this slide. And as I look at Joseph Smith Y chromosome and I pair and I compare that with uh, the reconstructed Y chromosome nine of the nine hostages, I found a, a striking resemblance, you know, with very few markers different and, and all the differences are one step mutations, which means that uh, uh, historically they're very close, meaning a 13 would become either a 14 or a 12, so one step up or one step down. If you have more than one value, those are two step mutations which increase the distance back to the common ancestor. So here we are looking are two family lines that are separated by at least uh, 1,000 to 1,500 years, and uh, they still carry a very similar Y chromosome. And so, uh, people from this county, Donegal County in Northern Ireland, uh, share about 20 percent. That they they have about 20 percent of the population that carry this particular Y chromosome. They carry the M222 SNP and they're linked to this legendary warlord nine of the nine hostages. And regardless if he existed or not, that is the royal family that would carry that particular white chromosome. So establish some sort of royalty, uh, a royal line for the Smith family, but surprisingly that was a, um, an Irish origin rather than a um, rather than an English origin, which was what was expected. So that is what I was able to discover for uh, the origin of the line. Now, as I was looking at this information, 
something that was brought up to me was uh, can we use this data to establish also uh, information about the posterity of Joseph Smith and uh, and that is because Joseph Smith as part of the theology of the Mormon Church in the 19th centuries this is about for about 50 years or so the Mormon Church practiced plural marriage um, it was in uh, it was in widespread there was a small percentage of the Mormon community um, that was involved with that uh, that came to an end in 1890 um, but Joseph Smith introduced and practiced uh, plural marriage and the question was well are there children that are born from women that were somehow connected to Joseph Smith uh, other than his first wife where he had the, the family that we all know uh, we all know and um, so I had individuals start contact me and say you know can we verify if so and so uh, is a child of Joseph Smith why because there were historical records at that time uh, that uh, were not very clear on the practice of polygamy or the extent the extent or the nature of this relationship and so some people believed or speculated that some individuals that uh, were born during uh, Joseph Smith's lifetime or immediately after his death in 1844 could have been his children and uh, so the question is can we use the DNA information to answer the question so this is a non-comprehensive list of children and their mothers, which are not, uh, which is, uh, is not Joseph Smith's first wife, but this will be women that uh, people believe they were also uh, united to Joseph Smith through some sort of ceremonial uh, union, um, and the children that were born. And this, uh, there are different sources uh, where this information comes from, uh, and and these are the children that people thought they could have been. Uh, you know, possibly Joseph Smith. So, uh, not all of them, of course, can be tested. Some of these kids died in their infancy, and we don't know where they're buried. They have no living descendants, but some of them have living descendants and can be addressed uh, normally. So, again, using the Y chromosome. Um, sorry, this this slide is in the wrong place. We're gonna go back um, after that. Um, I noticed it was wrong earlier, and I didn't, and I forgot to fix it. But um, this again is uh, the Y chromosome of Joseph Smith that will be in uh, uh, this is the same table broken in two parts to fit in, in this slide but if you look uh, the last part of both tables as Joseph Smith Jr. name on the top and that is the Y chromosome that we saw before and now we reconstructed that now the additional lines are five individuals that are from this list that you saw right here so these are five potential children of Joseph Smith from polygamous relationship. And I did the same process of reconstructing their Y chromosome as I did for Joseph Smith, meaning I found descendants for these people and tested them and then compared that to Joseph Smith and to other individuals that were uh, supposedly the biological father for these, uh, um, for these boys. So that was option A, Joseph Smith, option B, uh, the father that, that raised them and in each one of these cases as you can see the circle values they show very distinctive and separate paternal lines from Joseph Smith in fact in many of these cases I was able to actually confirm the paternity with the man that raised them and gave them their last name and so uh, all these five cases have been excluded there is actually a sixth case of another son his name is John Hancock, which is the brother of Mosiah Hancock, which is one of his five kids. Um, all these have been proven to be not uh, not to be Joseph Smith's sons. Um, there was an additional case which was more complex, that of a daughter, and that's where the slide, this slide should have shown up. It is it was one slide earlier, and that um, is a case of autosomal DNA because it is a potential daughter of Joseph Smith and she would not have received the Y chromosome of Joseph Smith, the person in question is here on the bottom left, Josephine Fisher, um, she would not have received Joseph Smith Y chromosome and uh, as, the, uh, as she's a girl she would have received her mother mitochondrial DNA and there are no questions surrounding the, the biological connection nature of her mother 
So the only option is to use autosomal DNA and she would have received 50% from her mother Sylvia Session who um, historically has been uh, uh, linked or, or married or, or associated to Joseph Smith Jr. And then the other 50% of Josephine DNA would have come either from Joseph Smith Jr. or from Windsor Lyon who was for a time married to Sylvia Session. And the story is, as far as I can tell, that Sylvia Session was married to Windsor Lyon and then eventually there was a separation or an abandonment where Windsor Lyon took off and left the Sylvia Session and as a, a single woman uh, there are records that say that she was uh, united to Joseph Smith during his absence and uh, at his abandonment. And then from that union in uh, January of 1844 was born Josephine Fisher. Joseph Smith died in June of 1844, so he would have been alive and potentially be the biological father of this daughter. So how did we go about that? Well, it's very complex because we're looking at autosomal DNA transmission from about 150 years ago and as I told you every generation will lose half of it that means that we need to find the oldest living descendants male or females of Josephine and Joseph Smith and find as many as possible of them and then compare their DNA both uh, first among the descendants of each of the two families and then compare the descendants between the two families to establish that relationship. So this is what I did. Uh, this is the historical affidavit that uh, the whole case study is based on and, uh, and basically um, Sylvia Session on her deathbed told Josephine that she was, you know, in red. She then told me that she, that I was the daughter of the Prophet Joseph Smith. She having been seated or married to the Prophet at the time that her husband Mr. Lyon was out of fellowship with the church and then he left. Um, this is an affidavit. Uh, Josephine was born in 1844. The mother told that to her daughter in 1882 on her deathbed, and uh, Josephine left the affidavit in 1915. So you can see it is something that uh, took a long time to be recorded. So maybe something was not recorded correctly or remembered correctly. But this is probably the strongest statement with regard to a possible existence of a child of Joseph Smith besides those children that he had with his first wife Emma. So how do we go to do that? So I collected 52 individuals DNA using, uh, sorry 56 DNA um, from using DNA tests from the major autosomal companies, those are 23andMe, Family 3 DNA, Ancestry DNA. Um, mostly I used 23andMe uh, because at that time was the best price and uh, uh, the easiest way to handle and manage multiple individuals under one account. Um, Ancestry DNA and family tree, family tree DNA would require a different account for every individual you want to do. Now lately Ancestry DNA is allowing you to, um, to do more people under the same account. In fact if I, would have, if I would have done the study today I would probably go with Ancestry DNA you know, with 23andMe uh, for different reasons. But, uh, back uh, when I did that about two years ago, um, 23 me made, made the most sense. The three individuals from Ancestry DNA were people that already had their DNA test with Ancestry DNA. So instead of paying for a new test, they simply submitted their DNA file to me. You can download um, a file of your DNA and then share that file with other people. So don't need to buy a new test. And then one person was done with Family Tree DNA because uh, um, this person was particularly old and uh, uh, was having difficulty in uh, spitting in a vial and, and uh, gathered the, uh, a sufficient quantity of uh, saliva. Instead, Family Tree DNA uses a, a mouth swab, a buccal swab, which you just scrape inside your cheek, so it makes the collection easier for individuals that, um, that have a problem in collecting DNA. All three of these companies use a similar technology provided by a California company called um, Illumina and uh, um, Illumina is uh, a, a company that uh, provides technology for um, university or government uh, uh, laboratories so it's a very well established um, techno technology um, 
for, for DNA testing uh, company, which then is the three different companies, 23 me from 3 DNA and 3 DNA, uh, used for their own testing. And um, so what happened is that although they're different companies, then the test is, is comparable and compatible with each other. And what I did was to download the raw file from each of these companies and put them into a um, open source public database called JetMatch, which also allowed me to manage multiple profiles under the same account. And in here, I was able to do a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison of each autosomal DNA for uh, each of these people. So, um, just looking, okay, so I was looking for, I, was, I thought there was a message for me. So, um, so basically I had now all the, the DNAs I needed from both families in, uh, uh, in this JET match. So these are, um, this is a, a table that I use as a reference for this study. This has been created by one of the top genetic genealogists out there. His name is Blaine Bettinger, a good friend of mine. Uh, lots of respect for him. Um, he just recently published a very good book uh, about genetic genealogy. If you, um, if you want to know um, what it is, just send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, send you the name of it. Um, I, can, I don't have it here right now. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it just was published last year. And it's a great book on, uh, on genetic genealogy. And he did this research called the Share CM project. CM stands for centimorgans, which is how DNA is measured in length and quantity. And, um, and so what it has here in the, you know, there is a lot of values here, so I won't spend too much time on it. But if you look on the right side, there is a column. And then uh, this column is divided in two columns. Well, the first column is a relationship column which shows uh, uh, how people were related that participated in this study. And in the second part of this column is the number of submissions, how many people or many pairs of individuals participated in this study. So the total is about 10,000 people that gave to Blaine um, information about their relationship to relatives. So by looking at this one, we have 800, the very first row, 889, aunt, uncle, uncle, niece, nephews, pairs or sets. And, uh, and so everyone says, you know, I tested myself and my uncle, and this is how much DNA we share. And, uh, and then another person will say, I test myself and my aunt, this is how much DNA we share. So if you look at the colorful table that you see there, and you look, uh, you start with self, which would be you, then you see to the top right corner, key corner from here, the aunt and uncle. So these 889 people tested, they submitted their DNA to this study to evaluate how much DNA we, need, which we inherit or we expect to see for any given relationship within a family tree. So in this particular case, we have 889 people that share this type of relationship between self and aunt and uncle. The expected amount of DNA share between these individuals is 25%. That's a little red number in the top corner. Uh, of each of these square, the range of DNA that has been observed between these 889 people is between 30, uh, uh, 1300 and uh, 2100, almost 2200, and then the average is about 1700 that uh, that is calculated on all the submissions. And actually, Blaine has a website which shows uh, um, the statistics and, and and the bell curve and the outliers for each one of these values, but what I have here basically is, um, um, is is a reference that I can use to establish and confirm relationship between, within the Smith family, within the Josephine family, and then between the two families to establish their relationship. Those are the two trees that are reconstructed. The top tree is the Smith family, and uh, every individual that has a red number uh, in both family, uh, the top family is the Smith family, the bottom family is the Josephine family, the Lion family, here she is with her picture and uh, um, where she would sit in both pedigree. If she would be the uh, a Joseph Smith daughter, she would sit up there in the top pedigree and then here is her descendants. So you see these pedigrees are quite horizontal, I'm not looking at that, I'm looking at the oldest living people which would carry the most DNA for the two people that I'm interested, which is Josephine 
and Joseph Smith Jr. because that is the father and daughter relationship I'm trying to establish. So um, I'm not interested in large quantity of individual, but good quality of individual that would be closer to him and that would sh or, to, or to her and share the most DNA uh, with this individual. There are a number of people in uh, in this tree um, that are circle. Um, that are the oldest alive individuals that participated in this study. So for the Smith family, they were actually at the time of this study, one has passed away since then, there are five individuals um, that are circling red that are actually the, you know, see you see that the descendants level, so you have son, grandson, and great-grandson. These are five great-grandchildren of Joseph Smith, and they would have, you know, Joseph Smith would have 100% of DNA, Alexander, his son, would have 50% of autosomal, and then uh, um, 25, and then 12, about 12%. So 50, 25, 12%. And, and these are the best candidates for this study. Then for Josephine, we have a, a green square right here. He's actually a living grandchild of Josephine, so he would have um, about 25% uh, uh, of her DNA. And if Josephine is Joseph Smith. Uh, daughter, it also would have 12% um, of Joseph Smith DNA and based on this tree, and we're going to see that, he would be a second ca uh, second half cousin of all these people in red, this man right here. So these people that are circle are the best candidates for this study. I also tested some uh, autosomal DNA for Hyron Smith, which is the brother of Joseph Smith, and some this, some uh, relatives of Joseph Smith, which are not descendant of Joseph, Josephine, which would be um, not connected to the Josephine-Joseph Smith relationship. And these individual, these additional individual tested, I use them as controls to answer the final question of Josephine uh, paternity. So here I have the, um, the, grand, the great-grandchildren of Joseph Smith, those will be the people with the 12 percent there on the top of each of these charts you know see there is five charts one for each one of them and then the relationship they share with each individual in the tree these are all Smith individual in light blue are Hiram Smith descendants they share the least DNA because they're most they're more removed from the the main tree and then all the ones in white are Joseph Smith descendants and so what we have here is for uh, table number one, we have one descendant. It will be, um, so this is T177361. So it will be this individual right here um, toward the right side of the top three. Uh, is actually passed away since then. Is the one that did the DNA test with family tree DNA. is a swab um, at that time. And so what I have here is him. And then uh, is uh, with everybody else on that tree that you saw, it will share a relationship as first cousin, first cousin once removed, second cousin, and so on and so forth. And then uh, this is based on Blaine Bentiger table that I showed you before, the expected amount of uh, um, uh, of DNA that you would you should find when you have this type of relationship uh, on the pedigree, and then the actual empirical data that uh, uh, we measure for those two individuals, how much they share. And so here what we have um, for all this is, is, a, is a very linear, um, as you can see from this chart, uh, a very linear relationship where individuals that are the closest, um, the closest related, we share the most autosomal DNA within a range uh, or, or very close to the range that we would expect, all the way to toward the right part of this chart of this histogram, you will see um, very little DNA expected and very little DNA uh, actually measured. And you see it's very linear. The further away you go, and the smaller the amount of DNA that you uh, actually observe, with one exception in the middle. Um, but those exceptions are also, when you have these many samples, are also expected. So everything looks good, meaning the genealogy is provided to reconstruct the top three uh, actually uh, line up very positively uh, with uh, the DNA uh, that we observe. So no surprises, no genealogical data that doesn't match genetic data because we think we're related in a certain way, but then again, you know, the milkman syndrome or some unre unreported, unlisted, or unrecorded 
uh, adoption, um, may I have uh, caused some problems. So everything looks good. The genealogy looks good. The DNA looks good. So second, same thing done with Josephine descendants. Told you we have one grandchild, so we use him in this particular case to make things um, brief. We use him as our reference, and so he is right here compared to everyone in this tree. So you see him at the bottom uh, of this table, it says table six, and then you have M885071. That's the code for the for the grandson of Josephine and how he compares to everybody else in the tree that we tested. And again, a very similar linear relationship, no surprises. The amount of expected DNA matches very nicely or line up very nicely with the amount of observed DNA with that. So we know that the, the two genealogies are accurate, the people are related in the way they think they're related. And now what we can do is to move to the next step, which is making a comparison between the great-grandchildren of Joseph Smith and the grandchild, the single grandchild of Josephine. So in this column, you have the first column, you have uh, the grandson of Josephine. In the second column, you have Josephine, Joseph Smith, five great-grandchildren that were tested. And the relationship that we share, if biological, is that of a half-second cousin. The expected amount of DNA that you would observe for an half-second cousin is about 106 centimorgans. But the actual amount of DNA that we observed was actually zero. So none of these five individuals um, from Joseph, Joseph Smith tree, these will be the people that would have the most DNA from Joseph Smith. They're still alive today, uh, or they were alive at the time of the study, um, have shared absolutely no DNA with the closest relative in, in time and generations to Josephine. So it looks like, based on this data, that um, Joseph Smith is not the biological father of Josephine. But who is the father of Josephine? So here is where the controls actually come handy. These are the individuals that are uh, related to Josephine through her father, Windsor Lyon. And uh, so again, you have the grandson in the first column that is the descendant of Josephine. And now you have five individuals that are found in the yellow square to the right. And uh, that these are the different relationships that they share. This is the expected amount of DNA, uh, which is less, you know, because it, the, the distance is greater. And yet, uh, although the, the relationship is uh, further away, the expected amount of DNA is less, we actually observe actual DNA share between uh, Josephine and his relative, with the exception of the last case, which is a zero, but based on Blaine Bentinger uh, table we saw before, zero is actually a possible value when you gain the half second cousin once remove range, which is what we uh, we have here because Winsor Lyon eventually remarry and have children with another wife, and so that will be a half relationship between Josephine descendants and her father's second marriage descendants. But what we have here is good, strong evidence of autosomal DNA sharing, which we did not see with the Smith family. And so based on this information, we can uh, confidently say that uh, Joseph Smith was not the father of Josephine, but Winsor Lyon was. But this is a very complex study. Um, we're about to publish this uh, shortly, but is. Uh, is basically the uh, the problem is again you you're trying to do a paternity test between two individuals that lived almost 150 years ago so there is not direct testing and what we're doing is reconstruct gen genetic information um, for several generations in the past but it can be done it can be done although it's again more, more expensive than a regular study so based on the um, on the um, DNA, Y chromosome of menatosomal DNA, have been able to exclude a number of children that have been recorded historically as Joseph Smith through plural marriage. And uh, um, the only children to, that have been tested and positive uh, today are those that were born from his first wife. Which, you know, uh, from a theological or historical point of view, I don't know what that means. You know, historians have to figure out what it means that. Uh, um, uh, maybe the nature of this marriage, you know, maybe they were just like some sort of spiritual union, maybe there was more, it doesn't mean that every time somebody's married to, uh, every time that you have sex with somebody, a child is born, but the point is, uh, at least these people, these descendants that were wandering 
if they were descendants of Joseph Smith, now they know, they confidently know uh, who, uh, how to trace their family history, who to write on their pedigree chart. Currently working on one uh, more of these cases, I uh, should be getting the results within the next week or two, and then maybe others will come um, in the future. I'm almost done. I have a couple more slides, and then I'll be willing to take some questions, if, if any. And that has to do with some mitochondrial DNA information that I put together for Joseph Smith. Now, Joseph Smith is a male, and as I told you earlier, uh, he would have not given his mitochondrial DNA to any of his children, and therefore he would have stopped with him. But he had some sisters, and through a sister, which also would have the mitochondrial DNA from their mother, you know, from Lucy Mack, who's the mother of both Joseph Smith and the sister, the sister's name was Catherine, I found an unbroken uh, mother to daughter line to today and been able to reconstruct a Y chromosome profile for Joseph Smith, you know, through the sister, he would have had the same Y chromosome. So this is Joseph Smith mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this belongs, as you can see, in the bottom left corner of uh, uh, the screen to a line called HV18, which is a fairly rare line and only uh, four people to date have been reported, in addition to Joseph Smith, four more people, four additional people have been reported as being as belonging to this HV18. Uh, it doesn't mean they're close female, um, close maternal relatives of Joseph Smith. All it means is that they have a common origin with him, which could be, you know, even a couple thousand years older. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is, um, has, has a mutation rate that is really slow, so it can be even a couple gen a couple thousand years in the past to, to before there is an actual maternal ancestor. But the interesting thing is that three of these individuals come from Iran, and one of them actually come from Italy, my country. So I kind of feel interesting that uh, uh, there are this connection with uh, a guy that probably came from Ireland, but whose maternal line eventually traced this connection with uh, um, these individuals. So nothing big here, maybe with time there will be more people tested, we'll have a better idea where this HV18 come from, but um, as of today, that is what we know about his maternal line as well. So we were able to say something about his paternal ancestry, uh, his, his paternal uh, posterity, autosomal DNA, posterity, and something about his mitochondrial DNA ancestry. All this about the same individual. So pretty good painting, if you will, of information that would have not been possible using traditional historical or genealogical information. And there is a lot more that has been added to the, to the history of this family. So now what? What's the future? Well, um, I, I told you I have over 20 individuals that are direct descendants of Joseph Smith, and as we lose 50% of the DNA at each generation, what it means is that in the next two or three generations there will be no one carry autosomal DNA for Joseph Smith or his wife Emma. So this is, you know, the technology is available, some of the descendants that uh, care, still carry some autosomal DNA are still alive, and so this is a great time, perhaps, to think about preserving genetic information of individuals of interest that lived in the past that would be a very complex to do so or impossible to do in the future. So <clears throat> what, what I'm thinking now for the future? Well, already have these 20 uh, uh, more people that are the closest living descendants of Joseph Smith uh, in number of generation, and the technology is available, so by collecting them I can do this uh, uh, sort of a comparing and uh, reconstruct actual segment of autosomal DNA for either Joseph Smith or Emma. Again, Joseph and Emma gave 50% of DNA to, to their son, so we don't know precisely if it's Joseph or Emma unless we look also at Joseph's brother autosomal DNA and then we start eliminating Emma uh, autosomal from this picture. But what you see here in this image is only four people and uh, that uh, that I took their autosomal DNA, compared it, and they are um, represented in this uh, genome scheme, which is uh, the 22 the 22 pairs of chromosome plus the X chromosome. So if I was able to do this only with four individuals, think when I have all 20 of them done, how many more segments will show up? How many more colorful bars will appear on this uh, on this screen? So that will be part of uh, in genetic preservation 
or uh, the, uh, the best possible reconstruction of the entire genome for this individual and then based on that, based on the mutation found in these segments you can say things or reconstruct information perhaps about the, the traits, color of eyes, uh, uh, predisposition to diseases, uh, capacity to absorb or, or uh, metabolize certain uh, chemicals or medication or products and so you know again disease will be another things that you can look on um, uh, for, for these people so this is uh, in my mind um, a very powerful uh, way to to get some family health family history from individuals that lived in the past that we might not know much about uh, from either medical records that could have been preserved. So that is all I had to share and I uh, hope you enjoyed this, uh, this presentation and hopefully, hopefully you also saw how that um, can apply to our uh, personal family history. So Don, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ugo. Um, I, will, uh, I will leave your, your screen on there. Uh, but uh, we are almost out of time. I don't know whether this thing is going to click off automatically, but there are a couple of questions here. Um, okay. And uh, but people had trouble again downloading that the handout. I don't know why that occurred. If you did have trouble, my email address is in the chat room. Send me an email, and I'll send you a copy of it. It's also the link is in there as well. Um, so, uh, a couple of questions that did come in. Where do you see DNA uh, testing going in the next few years? Uh, well, I, I, I think uh, um, what is happening right now is actually, uh, so the type of testing that they use, the autosomal testing, which is the newer testing available, uh, white chromosome mitochondrial DNA were the standards for a number of years and the only option um, autosomal DNA now has been around for a number of years and we have larger database Ancestry.com as the largest database with millions of people in it that have been tested but what we're doing here is that we're still doing a screening of the full genome so we have about 3.2 billion pieces of DNA in our genome you know the vast majority is our autosomal DNA but this type of test that we're buying from companies like Ancestry.com only gave a survey of about 500,000 of them, so 3.2 billion versus 500,000, and you can see uh, it's not very much. But at the same time, we don't we don't need to have the full genome done because about 99.9 percent .9 of our DNA is in common with everybody else that we know. So, but the point is that we're still gonna leave things out. Are you still there, Don? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And so what, what I'm talking about, the future of DNA is going to be, and is already happening, that we're going to be able to have the full 3.2 billion pieces of DNA tested. And it's already happening. There are already companies that are doing that for less than $1,000, which was the goal for the last 10 years that uh, scientists were hoping to get this uh, uh, $1,000 genome. You know, I think the cheapest company now is like somewhere between $800 and $900 and is doing that. And that is, price is going to continue to go down as technology improves. The point, the problem is going to be um, to have the technology to be able to handle that type of data and make those type of uh, comparison, you know, the databases that you need to build, the supercomputers that will need to, to be yeah. able to, to, hand, to handle that. So we're going to have more data available than what are we going to be able to handle and, and do with it for a while. It's going to be a good problem to have though. Uh, here's, here's a question. Uh, will uh, will you be able, will they be able as it goes on to be able to backtrack the testing later on? Will uh, in other words, will there be more ways of going back to test earlier things? Um, so with autosomal DNA, I said that we can only go back about five or six generation, or in, in other words, establish connection with second to fourth cousins. Um, uh, it kind of depends a little bit on how many people are tested. Right now, we have about you know four, five, six, maybe ten million people worldwide that have been tested. Compared to seven billion people, uh, that is not very many. It's also true that the majority uh, the, of people today have common ancestors, which means that uh, uh, th there is a much smaller percentage of people that lived in the past that are responsible for uh, uh, the birth of everybody that is alive today, okay? So now everybody that lived in the past 
isn't had children or grandchildren and therefore you know lions keep stopping and dying at a different level so yeah. we don't have that many people in the past that we need to reconstruct and we have a lot of people today so i'm thinking that as we have more people horizontally and more people alive today that are tested better genealogical information available that we will be able perhaps to go back a little bit in time without excluding the power of y chromosome and mitochondrial dna um which i didn't talk about it um, certain degrees in this presentation, but we can actually use white chromosome and mitochondrial DNA on additional lines in our family if we find the right people in our family to test. For example, I can test my maternal uncle and have the white chromosome for my maternal grandfather line. So although I do not carry that white chromosome by testing another person in my family, I can have two white chromosome lines represented in my tree. And the white chromosome goes back further than the autosomal DNA. So by identifying different people and using a combination of Y-chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, autosomal DNA, and the database is becoming larger, with more people tested and better genealogies available, we will be able to go back uh, in time with, with those. Um, that uh, uh, say that, um, but there was another thing, just uh, I don't remember, but that's, that's kind of how, how I see um, to be able to go back more in time. Uh -huh. And uh, is there, uh, when I was growing up, everybody used to, they'd clip off a lock of hair, of a baby's hair or something, and uh, they would uh, say, that, is it possible to make, get DNA? Uh, the, uh, the question is, is there any way to go back and get, after a person has died, to get the DNA without exhuming the body like you talked about? Yeah, I see that. The problem is that is uh, um, the line of uh, uh, possession of that sample meaning how in how many hands that sample has been before it uh, is tested. And uh, so, first of all, DNA in hair is not found in the shaft, it's found in the, uh, in the follicle, which is the part of the bulb, the part of the DNA that is inside the head, not the one that is growing out of it. And so when you cut hair, you do not have DNA of that person, you have an, uh, a protein uh, the actual DNA is in the cell, and the cell is in the follicle, and, oh. uh, and that's one problem. The second thing is that if you look at hair under a microscope, they, they look like uh, they have this little spike uh, on it that are invisible to the naked eye, but they're big enough that when you touch them with your bare hand, you can leave your DNA on it. So when yeah. you actually test the DNA of hair, especially cat hair, you have a greater chance to get DNA from the person that handled the hair rather than the person whose hair um, the hair belonged to. Yeah, right. So even if we had all those hair samples, they're not going to do as much good. No, no. And just because people did not know how to preserve that, um, you know, and they touched it with their bare hand, they, they've been in different places. Oh, yeah. And so there is like a, yeah, we just put it in a little envelope and stuck it in with the, with the pictures in the early days. Yeah. Like pull, pull hair, pull hair, not cut. Yeah, I <laughs> pull it all out. Okay, yeah. All well, right. you can, you can, you have a better chance to get DNA from like a leak stamp, for example, or a leak envelope. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, maybe if we had licked envelopes from some of our ancestors, we might be able to do yeah. that then. Yeah. Okay. For those uh, again, are... commercial, labor sorry, commercial laboratories today do not have standard procedures to um, extract DNA from this type of sample. Again. Uh, academic laboratories will be the ones to do it, but they're not easy to work with. So maybe in the future there will be more companies that will work on more difficult uh, cases, you know, like a jam or secret parts or, uh, you know, razors or things like that, that, uh, that we might get some DNA from our ancestors. Oh, well, so we've got to save all the old letters and envelopes for sure then. Yeah. <laughs> they may, uh, for those of you we'll who just are here, go out now. Uh, yeah, go out now and have your all your, your grandparents, so everyone that is old and alive, tested and preserve their DNA in these databases. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, to get all the testing done now before they do die. Yeah. For those of you who are here in Utah, in northern uh, Utah, next week is the what they call the PYU Education Week, and uh, Ugo is going to be giving a whole series of classes there that at on the BYU campus. But that's in yeah, I mean, One also. of them will be this one we had tonight. So do not come on my Thursday night. Thursday is Thursday morning. I'm gonna oh. do the same that I did tonight. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much, Hugo. It uh, took a lot of preparation and uh, wonderful insights into what was uh, going on here. We appreciate it very much, and I'm glad we have it recorded so that it'll be in our archives for those who are UGA members. Later they can uh, check it out and watch it again. So thank you very much for, uh, uh, for you, Hugo, for preparing it for us and for all of you, the rest of you folks, for attending with us. Thank so, you, Don. It was my pleasure. Okay, thanks. I will stop our recording now. Thank you very much and good night. Bye-bye.